I want to get back to some of the lessons that you have uh, in Don't Burn This Book. One of the ones that really struck me, because it was actually rather moving, is, is your discussion of your relationship with Jordan Peterson. So obviously Jordan is on the cover of the book. You're very tight with Jordan. Uh, I'm, I'm friends with Jordan, but you are really good friends with Jordan. I mean, you, you, were, you were on the road with Jordan for, for two years as his warm-up act, yeah. essentially. And uh, the, the events are fantastic. If you've ever been to one of the events with Jordan and Dave, I'd highly recommend it. Uh, I was privileged to, to help warm up the crowd at one of the events, and it really was a lot of fun. That, that might have been the best night of the whole tour because that it was, was right at the end. And we, we did it here at, in L.A. at the Orpheum. And, you know, when you do something in L.A., all the agents are there. And there's just like a different feel to it. The crowd was electric. You were the surprise guest. You brought me the little cake because people are, the lefties are very upset that you won't cook, uh, bake me a, a gay wedding cake. Although I have no reason to believe you're a decent baker. I don't want your cake, but you brought me a cake. People were very exciting. And it was a perfect example of the hypocrisy of the progressives because we do this event in front of 3,000 people. The crowd goes freaking bananas. We're up there, we're making jokes at each other, mocking each other. You do a pretty funny impression of Jordan. I mean, everyone, it was a freaking love fest in that room. People started posting the videos of it online and suddenly the amount of hate that I got Dave Rubin, self-hating gay, stands on stage with homophobe Ben Shapiro and white supremacist Jordan Peterson. And it's like, man, it, we took a room of truly diverse people and gave them a great time. We put differences aside. That's what America is all about. That, that's a beautiful thing that we need to cherish. And here are the supposed tolerant people who are upset that we actually were able to accomplish that. I know the fact that, that we, you and I can be nice to each other really does drive people <laughs> up a wall. It's pretty hilarious. But <laughs> but but to, but to talk about uh, about Jordan for a second. So yeah. obviously Jordan's been uh, you know going through some very very difficult times. I don't. You don't have to be a spokesperson here. Um, I, have you heard from him how he's doing? So I, I don't want to say anything that's not publicly known at the moment. I did see him a few months ago. I can tell you this: he's getting better. He will be back. Um, you know, watching some of the vitriol when it was announced that he had got hooked on these benzos, which, by the way, you know, there is a little bit of miscommunication or, or misinformation about what happened there. He was very open and would talk about it often during the lectures that he was taking a small amount of this. We found out in the middle of the tour that his wife had what they thought was terminal cancer. Thank God it turned out not to be terminal, and she's actually doing much better. Um, but, he, you know, try to imagine this guy who was a mild-mannered uh, psychologist and professor who suddenly became the world's father in a way. You know, like the really the preeminent public thinker of our time, traveling the world, the fame, the hit pieces. You know, you remember the enforced monogamy hit piece in uh, the New York Times, and you remember the Kathy Newman, so what you're saying is moment, and all those things. Living through all of that, then thinking his wife is going to die. I mean, I was literally at lunch with him. We were at lunch at a steakhouse, of course, when he got the call about his wife. I saw this man live through something unbelievably, extraordinarily horrible, or, or as he would say, brutal, and always put his best foot forward. So I, I can't say anything more about that specifically other than I never saw him break one of those rules, and, and I saw him just trying to be true. And if, if he gave me anything through osmosis or, or accident, it's that. I, I am really, really trying to do that. And it doesn't mean that I do it every moment of every day, but I, I try to incorporate those ideas, those rules, and just being with someone that, you know, his whole, his whole mission really was, you know, if you fix yourself, if you clean your room, if you stand up straight with your shoulders back, you might start fixing the world. And I saw him trying to do that. And I saw him actually accomplishing it. So, you know, he's got a little, uh, he's got something to deal with right now. And I have no doubt that he will deal with it and that he'll be back. Yeah, you, you tell a pretty great story in the book about uh, how Jordan dresses when, when he's out in public. And it is true. I mean, Jordan dresses the same way all the time. He's, it, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when Jordan dressed more like a schlub. Like, I remember right yeah. at the beginning when, when Jordan was not nearly as natty in his attire as, as he is now. And, and as you point out in the book, he, he sort of took it on himself that he was going to dress in a particular way. And then that is how Jordan dresses all the time. Uh, and, uh, and I was wondering if you talk a little bit about some of the lessons that you've learned from Jordan. Yeah. Well, the, the dressing, is, it's just a very simple one, but it's, it's just to present yourself a certain way to the world. And I asked him during the Q&A, so when we did the shows for, for your audience that didn't see any of the shows, I would do about 15 minutes of warm-up up top and just get everybody laughing and having a good time. Then Jordan would give about an hour and a half lecture, and then we'd do about a 45-minute Q&A together at the end. 
And one of the questions that would often come up is, Jordan, when did you become a middle-aged uh, male fashion icon? And he would say, well, you know, when we started this tour and I had this book, I thought I'm gonna give it everything I got. And part of that is, is looking the part that I wanna look. So he went from those frumpy yellow shirts that you've seen on YouTube from those old lectures into three-piece fitted, sharp, you know, suits and Italian shoes and the whole thing. And there was one day where we were in Stockholm, Sweden, and you know, it's so funny because Sweden is one of the places that the socialists and Bernie Sanders, they always point to Sweden as if it's their Shangri-La, this absurdly tiny, mostly homogenous country, which is less homogenous now and having all sorts of problems, but they don't like to tell you that. But they always say, we could just model ourselves after Sweden, we'd be in much better shape. Well, the two shows that we did in Sweden sold out literally in three minutes, three minutes for two shows, and the foreign minister of Sweden issued a statement when we came back to Sweden. We did one and then I think we left for Finland. We come back, the foreign minister issues a statement that she wishes that Jordan Peterson would crawl back from the rock that he came from. And we get there and it's like people in Sweden have a serious, they have a crippling free speech issue there because the society is so conforming that people are just afraid to say what they think about, about anything, about immigration, about economics, the whole slew of things, but the story quickly, we're in Stockholm and it was extremely windy that day and I just wanted a hat to walk around the city. So I walk into H&M, which is one of their proud exports. I walk into H&M and there's a, I grab the hat. There's a young kid who's probably about 20 years old in front of me online and he says to the cashier in English, he says, uh, this is the first suit I've ever bought. I'm going to see Dr. Jordan Peterson tonight. And the cashier who's about the same age looks at him and says, I'm going to see Peterson tonight. And I tap the kid on the shoulder and I said, hi, and they immediately knew who I was. And I thought, this is absolutely incredible. I am, I am across the world right now, right? I'm across the world, and here are two young people, one of whom who's buying the first suit of his life so that he can present himself in a responsible way to go to an event to hear how he can further fix his life. How, how much more do you want of that? And then one other I'll give you real quick, we're in, I think it was in Dublin, and you know, when you do these theater shows as the performer, you don't walk out the front because you know, you'll get mobbed or whatever. So they have a little theater door on the side. We walk out after hours. And this is a long day of travel. And you know, he's signing autographs. He's shaking hands, the whole thing. We're, we're, we're beat at the end of the day. We're in the alley. And we see these two guys hugging. One looks like he's about 60. The other one's maybe in his mid-20s. They come up to us. They both have tears in their eyes. And it turned out that they were a father and son who hadn't seen each other in five or six years who by chance both were at the event because they had bought the book and started to fix their lives and then they reconnected that, that night. It's like how much more of a real world example of goodness do you want to see, you know? And I could give you a million of those stories. Thank you for tuning in to The Daily Wire, one of the fastest growing conservative media outlets in the country. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out on any of our content.